Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here. Um, today I want to talk about the symptoms of a Hashimoto's flare-up, um, specifically what those symptoms are, and then also what what you can do about them or or how to what 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 steps you can take to kind of reduce those symptoms. So, um, first of all, you probably already know that Hashimoto's is a condition um, that fluctuates over time. Okay, and what that means is that you may go through episodes where the existing symptoms you have may flare up or get worse and that's called the, the Hashimoto's flare-up. Now what's important is that you distinguish the causes of those flare-ups so that number one you can prevent them and number two you can um, reduce the duration for which they last, right? So let's say that you know something is going to cause your, your uh, flare-up in, in your body. The goal would be to say, okay, well, instead of dealing with this flare-up for six months, how about we treat the problem so that it only lasts for one or two months? Okay, so what symptoms am I talking about? Now, now first of all, it's important to realize that each person is going to have different symptoms because everyone is unique. Everybody is going to present a little bit differently. So whatever symptoms you experience is going to be heavily dependent upon your body. Now I will point out that the symptoms of the flare-up in your body tend to be similar each time you have a flare-up, right? So what that means is, let's say the, the flare-up symptoms in you result in extreme fatigue and hair loss, right? So anytime you have a flare-up, it's probably going to present with those two symptoms. Okay. Now, this should be compared to the, your neighbor or some other person you know that has Hashimoto's. Their flare-up symptoms may be something like weight gain and, I don't know, GI problems, right? Whatever. It does, doesn't matter. But the point is, they're going to present differently than you. But the unifying theme here is you tend to present with the same flare-up symptoms whenever you have a flare-up. And this is important because it helps to distinguish just, uh, you know, issues, other issues that may cause hair loss in your body or gastrointestinal problems problems in this other person, right? So that's that's where this is useful. Not not that the, the the specific the thing that's useful is that you know or you can identify that the symptoms you're experiencing are caused by the flare up itself. So let's talk about in a general sense what those symptoms might be, how people present with them. So this is just the most common list of of um, symptoms that patients have um, have expressed to me that they experience. Now, this isn't an all-encompassing list by any means, but what it can do is give you an idea um, to help you understand, are your symptoms related to a flare-up or are they related to something else? So, number one would be abrupt worsening of fatigue. Now, I say worsening because many Hashimoto's patients have fatigue at baseline, okay? And fatigue, and this this is actually kind of a, a kind of a complex topic because what can happen is fatigue can be a, a symptom of hypothyroidism due to low cellular thyroid energy production, but it can also be a result of of a number of other issues, including other hormone imbalances, including even weight gain. Okay, so just having excess weight on your body can can cause fatigue. So what you need to distinguish is that whatever existing fatigue you may have, and right, this usually comes from a from under treatment of hypothyroidism. Let's just point that out right there. Um, but whatever existing fatigue that you may experience, let's say that's twenty or thirty percent. People, uh, you know, let's say your energy is, you know, 20, 30% normal, right? So if you have a worsening of fatigue, it may go up to 60 or 70%. So that's what I'm saying, a worsening of fatigue that's already existing. And and by the way, usually existing fatigue at baseline is not a good sign. It's usually a sign that you're missing something or being undertreated in some way, okay? Um, that's probably the most common unifying symptom that I see in probably, ev you know, mo I shouldn't say all, but most patients that have Hashimoto's and have a flare and have flare-ups. Second thing. Um, weight gain from an unclear source, especially, especially if you've done, if you've made no changes to your diet or it, to the amount of food that you're eating. So this would be somebody who, you know, let's say you're just well, whatever, 150 pounds, and you're you have a pretty healthy diet, you know, following the 80/20 rule uh, most of the time, eating like a paleo-esque type diet, and all of a sudden you change nothing about your diet or the amount that you're exercising or anything like that, and within a month you gain 10 pounds. That is not normal, right? That, that's not, not, not normal by any stretch of the imagination. So that's what I mean from an unclear source. Now, let me put this into context. Because if you gained weight and you started eating, you know, let's, let's say that you started eating a lot of pizza or something like that. Okay, right. You know where it came from. But let's say, let's say um, another example would be you haven't changed your diet. However, you're under a tremendous amount of stress from work. Okay, so something like that, you, you can... You can the cause and effect can be correlated with one another, so it has to be from an unclear source, and that's usually an indication of you know progressive damage to the thyroid gland in some way. But but that's a distinction I want to I want to make an unclear source. Okay, 
general feeling, third, number three, general feeling of weakness or malaise. That's kind of the um, medical term for feeling crummy or just crappy, right? So, so I've heard people refer to this as feeling puny. Um, somebody who's just it's not like it's different than fatigue because you may just kind of feel achy or sore all over. You just don't have the, the, the gumption to get out and do the things that you would normally. It's not due to fatigue. It's just due to kind of feeling blah all over the place. And this actually has a name, malaise, right? So it has a name and it needs to be distinguished from fatigue because it's an indication of something different. Okay, so that's number three. Number four, abrupt worsening of joint pain or muscular pain. All right, now I would say this is actually probably fairly common as well and something that I tend to hear quite a bit uh, about from my patients, especially during their flare-up. So um, some people have existing joint pain and generally speaking, if you're a Hashimoto's patient, you have existing fatigue at baseline. You might also have some degree of existing joint pain um, or muscle pain. Um, now, again, this is just an abrupt worsening of that. So, it's, so you have to consider what your baseline is and then any increase from there would be considered abnormal. Now, I will also point out that like many of these symptoms, it's just not normal to have joint pain at baseline. It's not normal to have muscular pain at baseline. So these are usually indications that whatever whatever treatment you're undergoing is probably not the best, right? But, but it's worth mentioning. Okay, so second one would be, um, or the next one would be racing heart, jittery sensation, or feeling... Um, an uncomfortable rush. This could be like a flush or, or some something like that. It's been described to me as internal tremors or just like a feeling that you're overheating or any of these other uh, words that I've used to describe it. And this is just exactly how patients tell me they experience it. Now, this one is more likely to be related to one of two things. So the other symptoms we talked about, the previous ones before this, so the the weakness or malaise, uh, the weight gain, the worsening fatigue, etc. Those are most likely to be due to abrupt worsening of thyroid function. But what can happen in Hashimoto's is that you can actually have uh, a, a flush of thyroid hormone into your body as a result of the inflammation in the thyroid gland itself, which results in hyperthyroid-like symptoms. Um, and this is temporary, right? This is temporary. And usually, Usually, um, it results in hypothyroid symptoms like afterwards, um, you know, maybe after a couple of weeks or something. But some patients do experience this. It's like you can actually express thyroid gland, thyroid hormone from your thyroid gland by simply pressing on it. Now, I do not recommend you do this, right? Do not, don't touch your thyroid gland. But the point is, it, it, it's it's a, like a sponge that has hormones inside of it that can be expressed or released, you know, due to various causes. It could, mechanically, it could be, um, you could force thyroid hormone out by touching it or, you know, trauma or something like that. And then on the other, on the flip side, it can also be forced out from inflammation, same concept. So if you just have a sudden flush of of uh, thyroid hormone to your serum, the, the result may be some of these things, racing heart, jittery sensation, you know, the rush, the flush, etc. All right, so that's that one explained a little bit more. Um, abrupt onset of brain fog, difficulty concentrating, or inability to focus on difficult tasks. You know those things. These are actually very, very common at baseline um, among Hashimoto's patients. I would say that a lot of patients have some baseline fatigue, some baseline malaise, which is that blah feeling, and then of course some baseline brain fog, right? These three symptoms, in my opinion, are the most common among Hashimoto patients at baseline, whether or not they have a flare-up or not, okay? Um, changes in GI function, we mentioned that briefly. Um, and then here's where they can be a little bit tricky. So some patients may experience more or less symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and some patients may experience more or less symptoms of, of hypothyroidism. And this is why, it's, why I mentioned in the beginning, it's really important for you to figure out how your body reacts to it. What what are the signs and symptoms in your body? These, this is just a general framework to to help you um, uh, understand your body, but it doesn't mean that this is you, right? This this could be different for, you know, if we picked 100 patients with Hashimoto's, I guarantee you each of them would present slightly different. So again, use this as a framework. So the question is now becomes, what are you supposed to do about it, right? Or, or how can you identify what caused it? Because Hashimoto's flare-ups Hashimoto flare-ups are caused by something. So I've come up with the most um, the most common reasons that this occurs, and I put them in order, and we'll elaborate just a little bit. Um, if you want more information on how to go about these things, I would recommend that you come to this post because I elaborate on these things in more detail and provide the liter liter uh, literary studies, etc. Um, but let's at least talk about these. So number one, by far and away, um, the causes of Hashimoto's flare-up symptoms, especially, is extreme physiological or emotional stress. And I put in parentheses here the examples of a death of a loved one. Okay, is that mom, dad, you know, something like that. Um, divorce, especially. Um, or even, I should, I should actually probably point out here too, the, the results, um, the consequences of having a divorce in terms of 
how that interacts, like your social life with, with kids, if there are any kids, financial issues, things like that. I, I tend to have a lot of patients um, who are women who divorce, at least in some, some way, either directly or down the line as a consequence of, of these things, uh, develops Hashimoto's. It's actually, just, it's actually very common. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that it's kind of a go here, but it is, that's a, that's a trend I see. And then of course, other problems, right? This could be problems at work or home or home or school, whatever, with your kids, uh, drugs, anything like that. Anything that's causing you a severe amount of a physiological or emotional stress. Um, this is, in my opinion, probably the number one cause and most common. And it also consequently is probably the more difficult of all of them to treat, right? Because it's easy for me to say, hey, stop stressing out. But how are you supposed to do that if, if whatever you, whatever is causing the stress in your life is not under your control? Right, like there, there's nothing that we can do about your divorce or about a death of a loved one. We we can't. So what you have to do is you have to de- you have to have to have to develop mechanisms that help your body manage the stress that it's under. So this might include um, this might include um, advanced concepts of to trying to train your brain um, on how to interpret the emotions that you may be feeling, how to not suppress those emotions so that they may cause issues or that you never actually let them go. Um, this may include things like uh, taking adrenal adaptogens to help support the your hormonal systems during these flare-ups. It could be a lot of these things, and and I go into detail on how to kind of go about these. Again, I'm see or looking towards a a spiritual source for guidance, uh, yoga, uh, any of these things would would help your body manage the stress. But if if possible, if possible, we want to completely eliminate the stress. But I understand and recognize that that isn't always possible. Okay, so that's number one, definitely the most important, probably also the most difficult to treat. Number two. Uh, this isn't even an order of in terms of uh, significance, but we'll just talk about it briefly. Physical trauma, okay? Anything that you know causes direct trauma to the gland can result in inflammation and a flare-up symptom. This is actually pretty uncommon. It's you know it's short of getting what th- punched in the throat or you know an airbag going off uh, and hitting your your gland or so- something like that. I mean, it's just it's not all that altogether that common. Um, chronic nutrient deficiencies would be another big one. Um, things that perpetuate inflammation in the body. So your body is already on a, on a state of, let's say, hyper excitability in terms of the immune system. And so any slight deviation from that sort of excitable state will result in the increased inflammation in the gland and therefore flare up symptoms. So these have to be addressed. And obviously this is actually a pretty straightforward one. Right? Things like zinc, selenium, fish oil, all the vitamin D, all the basic things that promote uh, immune system balance and, you know, things that you just need to replete in your body. Like this, this is pretty basic, I, but it's, it's worth spending at least some time on. If they, if they are not repleted, then you're just going to leave your body in a position where it's easier to get excitable and easier to go into the flare up symptoms. Um, another big one are viral infections. Uh, specifically CMV and EBV, Epstein-Barr virus or infectious mononucleosis. Um, you may know it as any or all of those names. CMV is different, but cytomegalovirus. But um, So viral infections, uh, in my experience, don't necessarily pot- they don't necessarily potentiate Hashimoto's flare-ups. However, they may and probably are involved in a lot of um, the initiation of the disease itself. Okay, so what that means, let me just explain that. So what that means is, the, your Hashimoto's may have been caused or at least triggered predominantly in part by a, the initial Epstein by, Epstein-Barr viral infection that you might have received as a teenager or as an adult or something like that. So basically what I'm saying is Epstein-Barr virus may cause your disease in some way. Now, you can't put all the blame on it because there's a bunch of other factors that kind of set the stage for that to occur, at least at the genetic level from epigenetics and such. But it is important to know that at least viral infections have they, they play some role in, in Hashimoto's in terms of the potentiation of the disease and pro, or not the potentiation, but the initiation of the disease and maybe the potentiation of the disease. Although I don't think that's as common as people think it is because um, I've treated a lot of viral infections and it doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily get rid of Hashimoto's. Well, doesn't definitely doesn't. Well, I should say sometimes it can, but usually doesn't result in complete uh, um, remission of Hashimoto's itself. So that's a consideration. Um, other uh, hormonal balances that alter your immune system and immune function. So you want to think of the hormone systems in your body as a as a as a net um, or a spider web. In that, if one strand is pulled, the whole kind of spider web kind of goes uh, astray, or you know, it messes with the whole system. So just think of it like that. Basically, and if you have hypothyroidism, that sets the stage for low progesterone, um, high estrogen. Uh, low testosterone, a number of other things, right? So you want to keep an eye on the other, those things. And I talk about this ad nauseum on my blog, so you can, you can find more information on that. Another big one that's underappreciated, I would say, probably up there with number two, with number one, which is the extreme physiological stress. I'd probably put this one as number two, which is exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I have a full list of that below, but you can see the PCBs, um, 
all that BPA, triclosan, etc. So this this exposure to these endocrine disruptors um, can definitely trigger autoimmune disease, but they also uh, can potentiate Hashimoto symptoms. So you have to have usually treatment for Hashimoto's flare-up involves some sort of detoxification of the body so that you can actually get rid of this stuff. Okay, very important. Another one would be exposure to heavy metals. Um, this one, uh, more of the initiation and potentiation. This one's a little more tricky, but it's worth at least mentioning. And then, of course, the final one would be increased intestinal permeability. And what that's referring to is basically leaky gut um, or whatever you want to call it. But basically what's happening is there's some inflammation at the level of the intestinal epithelial junction, those, those cells that are supposed to keep uh, things from getting inside, but also absorb good things and keep bad things from getting inside. Whenever you have inflammation at that level, these junctions become the, less uh, occluded to one another. So they have they begin to form spaces and gaps between one another, which allows larger than normal particles to get through, which through the, this... Uh, process called molecular mimicry, your body confuses foreign foreign objects for self, and then you have crossover reaction, and then you develop, you know, your body may say, oh, this molecule, let's just say gluten or whatever, it doesn't matter, any peptide, or um, your body just recognizes it and says, hey, that kind of looks like the thyroid gland, uh, we better kill this thing, and so then, you know, it, you, you have cross-reactivity between those anti, between the antibodies, so that's kind of how things can trigger, so that must be treated, because that is for sure something that can potentiate the disease state of Hashimoto's and inflammation and autoimmunity. So that actually ended up being a lot longer than I um, had anticipated. I was hoping that would actually be a short video, but I guess I just can't not talk. So anyway, um, I hope you guys found that helpful. If you have any questions regarding Hashimoto's flare-up symptoms, or um, let me know. Please leave them in the comments section below because I'd like to expand upon this list of symptoms in terms of what's common and, and how exactly you treat it. So I, I want to know. I want to hear from you. Let me know because the more information that we have, um, the better that we can do in helping people. So anyway, I hope you guys found this helpful. I will talk to you guys soon.